support begins in three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of Nurture and Support, a podcast where we share all of the awesome that we find out there with you and hope that you will return the favor someday. I'm Mel at Karmic Night on Twitter, and here again is the Kelly. Hi, everybody. It's Kelly Tool, the Kelly, at K-E-L-L-Y-T-H-U-L on Twitter. And Mel and I are super excited to have, I guess we call you longtime friends of the show, even though there's not like a long time to the show. But from the <laughs> beginning of the show, John and Helena McGevna have been great supporters of the show, listening, offering suggestions, and uh, and nurturing and supporting. And so this is the first time we have two guests with us today. So... Uh, John and Helena, if you'd like to just uh, introduce each of each of yourselves, maybe give your Twitter handle. Right. Hi, Kelly. How are you doing today? And uh, Mel, it's good to be here with you. Uh, I'm John McGevna at McGevna, M-C-G-E-V-N-A. And uh, Kelly said, uh, you know, a long time uh, listener to uh, Nurture and Support and uh, other uh, Snark Alec radios and uh, just uh, looking forward to uh, speaking with you today. We're glad to have you. And I'm Helena McGevna at Helly McG on Twitter, and I am just thrilled to be on the world's greatest knitting podcast. <laughs> <No>! <laughs> well, join us next uh, week when we will not be having. <laughs> yes, yes. Helena and I talk knitting on uh, Twitter all the time, y'all. So she is an excellent knitter, much better than me, much better trained than me as well, from what I gather. <laughs> I have no training unless you count YouTube. So we're so glad to have you all with us today, though, because that's be cool. We've been friends on Twitter for a long time, and uh, mm -hmm. it's great to finally get you all on here to share some cool recommendations with us. Well, I hope, so, you, I hope you enjoy them. Oh, I'm sure that I'm sure that we will. We will. It won't be anything as I'm sure as lame as I can come up with. <laughs> but uh, well, let's see. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm strong today. Really, I am. So we're going to jump right on into recommendations. And my first one, or I guess my only one today, is for another podcast. So don't abandon us for this one. But this is one that I've enjoyed for a while now. And it is called The Drabblecast. It's a, I guess you would call it a book-related podcast. What they actually do is every week they narrate um, a short story, short fiction, and put it up on a podcast. It's very well done. It's very well produced. They usually have a little bit of music. Um, and unlike a whole lot of these things that are out there, their stuff can be new short fiction that's put out. They actually pay for the stories that they narrate. So it's a pay market for... Um, authors out there. They do a good blend of new authors and um, some older established ones that have some short fiction out there that they would like to get, get put up. But it is run by a Norm Sherman and it started in 2007 and I, I like the byline because it kind of fits me. The byline of it is strange stories by strange authors for strange listeners. And I think I pretty much fit the strange listener category there pretty well. But it includes stories from any particular genre. They're not really picky. It's um, mostly going to be horror and science fiction related. Um, but they include anything in between. And actually one of my favorite ones that I've listened to which I will give you all a link in the blog post, is actually episode 295, and I don't think I would include it in any particular genre. I suppose it might be considered science fiction at some point, but it's set in present-day America, and it's called 20 Ways the Desert Could Kill You. And uh, I, I love it. This is one of my favorite episodes of the entire um, of the entire podcast, and I listen to it all of the time. I couldn't even begin to tell you how many times I've listened to this particular story. It is by Sarah Pinkster, and it's read by Michelle Restucia, or Restucia, I'm not sure how you say her last name, and I'm sure I butchered it. But it's the story of a young girl whose mother moves them out to the desert. And it's told through basically this list of 10 ways the desert could kill you that this girl has made in her journal. 
and through those lists and her discussion of them, you start getting a, re a clue as to why the mother has moved them out to the desert. And um, it's a little, it's a little surprising. Might be a little uh, post-apocalyptic. You don't know. So I like it because it leaves you to draw your own conclusions at the end. But it's a very good one, and that still remains my favorite episode of the entire podcast. Um, and it's actually one of the first ones I ever listened to. There is another one that will probably give you nightmares if you're like me and you have a problem with clowns. Yeah. And a lot of people have a problem with clowns because clowns are just wrong. But they um, recently started up kind of a sister podcast called Drabble Classics because a lot of the really old episodes aren't available, I think, in the iTunes feed anymore. So they're doing another one called Drabble Classics where they're bringing out some of their, the best of the old episodes. And there's an author named Jay Lake who recently passed away due to cancer. So his episode, which has been one of their most popular ones and is actually one of the ones they recommend for new listeners to listen to, is called Clown Eggs. And it's only about 15 minutes long. And I think it will probably give you nightmares for the rest of your life. If, if you're sensitive to clowns, and I really wish, <laughs> this is how bad my clown problem is, I really wish I hadn't listened to this, because <laughs> I don't need, I don't need more clown trauma in my life, but it's a 15-minute episode entitled Clown Eggs by Jay Lake, and um, it, if you like clown stories, it, it will put a twist on clowns that I think you'll like, or you will absolutely hate me for telling you to go listen to. Well, you've you've warned them sufficiently, I believe. Uh, so I yes. think we're okay. And yes. and clown trauma is a great band name, by the way. So absolutely, absolutely. But I don't ever want to see clown trauma in concert ever, ever. Especially but not they... in costume. <laughs> oh no, no, clowns are just so wrong. They're so wrong. Um, let's see. I think that's probably about all I have to say about it. Uh, it's a podcast I really, really enjoy. I tend to binge listen, so I'll, you know, I might miss it for a month, and then I'll sit down and listen to all of the episodes in one sitting. But I, I really enjoy it. These are weird, weird type stories that you're not really gonna gonna hear anywhere else. It's completely free. Uh, they would love donations because they do pay for these stories. So if anybody out there ends up really enjoying this podcast, um, you know, you might throw them a buck or two because they do completely support paying these authors for their stories. But um, it, it's cool stuff. I really, I really think you'll like it. It's the best of speculative fiction that's out there. It's really well produced. It's not, it's not like me sitting down and reading a short story um, into this microphone for all of you. It's really well produced. And um, Norm is is a very good voice actor as well as a, an author. Some of the stories that he reads are his own. But um, I think you'll enjoy it. There's a number of really cool things in there for everybody, whether you're into science fiction or you're into Lovecraftian type horror. Um, and just plenty of cool, weird stuff. Like it says, strange stories for strange listeners. You'll enjoy it. That's Very all I got. Cool. Excellent. All right. So the McGevness, you're up. Okay, very good. I'll start it <laughs> off if I can. Uh, my recommendation uh, for this week is a, a YouTube uh, podcast called Dotto Tech, D-O-T-T-O-T-E-C-H. And it covers all things uh, new in uh, tech and is produced by Steve Dotto. Who, and Steve is a uh, longtime host of uh, an executive producer of Dotto Tech, which is Canada's uh, longest running tech TV show. And they produce a new video every week and post it on YouTube. And it shows how tech can fit into your daily life. Uh, covers all aspects of it. I found it especially useful on Google. And Steve is an older fellow, uh, not quite my age, but, uh, but up there. And he explains these technical aspects of uh, the internet to uh, people like myself who try to keep up but are just not quite uh, you know, part of the A team. You know, we're not ready for prime time, and uh, it's not like you know, a bunch of 16-year-olds sitting around saying, oh, yeah, do this and write this and write that. No, Steve uh, shows it to you right on the uh, nice life of driving. He says, okay, you check here, you do this, and you pull this down on Google, and you make this adjustment, and, you know, it makes your life a lot easier. He also does uh, technical reviews of uh, various pod uh, 
production and how to uh, produce your own webinars. Oh, uh, that's yeah, cool. Se seminars on that, which are very well produced and has some um, mm -hmm. very good people to come in on. And we saw one just last week. And I'm going to send you uh, the links on that uh, that you can post onto the uh, uh, Nurture and Support. And awesome. hey, Scott, yes, does does he offer any tips on how some people might overcome evil knitting podcasts in terms of? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think on iTunes. <laughs> I tell you, I think he's in the tank to the evil knitting podcast. Oh no! Yeah, yeah. it's I Canada. Didn't... It's got a lot of fiber, a lot of wool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's some, some things uh, you just can't do up there. Yeah. Oh, well, well I think that that sounds great. I, I think there's a lot of people. I don't I don't know if it's just me, but I notice even among a lot of young people these days who us uh, us that are up there think that, oh, these kids all know how to do this stuff. Um, I, I find out that I think most of them don't know what they're doing. They yeah. might know how to do something, but they don't understand what they're doing. Uh, those of us who had to learn it back at the beginning, I think we understand the mechanics behind what things are, are working way more than the the young people. I, I end up having to help some right. high school Steve, age Steve kids for stuff. Good, uh, yeah, they, they may be very good at doing things, but then explaining them to you in terms that you yeah. know, someone like myself could understand, that's not always that easy. And mm -hmm. Steve makes it very easy for you to understand, okay, I see, I see the steps that I have to do to... Uh, to make my uh, Google Mail uh, better organized, right? For example, uh, very worthwhile. Lots of good stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I recommend. It. I think you'd enjoy it. Yeah, right. uh, cool. I hadn't heard of that one, so I'm going to check that out. I love all that tech stuff. Very good, and that's my recommendation. So I'll awesome. take it over to my better in half and let her uh, jump in. <laughs> all right. If this oh, is okay. a new podcast. Elena, before you start, if this is a knitting podcast <laughs> recommendation, we're going to have words. Well, no, Nurture and Support is the greatest knitting podcast because what do you think I'm listening to when I'm knitting? Oh, okay. There you go. All right. There you go. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So my, my recommendation is a book. It's not about knitting. Um, it's called The Toaster Project. Um, and the little tagline to it is, or a heroic attempt to build a simple electric appliance from scratch. It's written by a man named Thomas Waits, who at the time of this uh, adventure was a second year postgraduate design student at the Royal College of Art. So he decided that he would make a toaster from scratch. And he basically decided he had three rules to make this toaster. That it had to be like the one they sell in the stores. So it couldn't be, you know, the old timey, take a piece of metal, stick it on the burner. It had to be a real electric toaster. Um, that it must make all the, that he must make all the parts from scratch. So he couldn't go out and buy a, a spring. He couldn't go out and buy a casing. He had to make them from scratch. And that he must make the toaster with normal tools that were available pre-industrial revolution. So that so also... He's, a, in, he's yeah. a glutton for punishment, in other words. <laughs> uh, very much so. Um, he, uh, he basically, uh, in his rules, he basically decided that he was not allowed to travel by plane which kind of limited him to uh, Great Britain. Um, so he could only take like a train or walk to wherever he was going to go to make these things. So he, got, he went down to the British version of Target and picked up a toaster that cost three pounds and something. And he took it apart and realized that uh, this toaster had 404 distinct parts. So he kind of he kind of uh, pared those down as much as he possibly could, and then his mentor in this project was um, a professor at the um, the Imperial College of Metallurgy or something. Oh, and he went know. over. <laughs> Such a cool. Over. I want that college shirt. <laughs> <laughs> So he goes over to, he, he sits down with this professor and decides that he needs to make, uh, be able to access steel, mica, plastic, 
copper, and nickel. And the book takes, through, takes him through what he needed to do to, to get this stuff. So <laughs> to get steel, he wound up having to go to an iron mine near Wales. And he calls up the guy, and it's, it's, a, it's an antique kind of uh, mine. He calls up this guy and says, I, I'd like to come and mine some ore. And the guy thought he just wanted a tour. So he shows up. He said, I didn't bring a pickaxe because I thought one would be provided. And um, the guy takes him down through this mine and is like, you can't just start hacking away at the walls. So he gives him a suitcase full of iron ore and he takes it to his mother's backyard and makes a furnace that, um, out of basically um, hair dryers and a leaf blower and attempts to smelt iron ore. So, you know, smelting is hard, yo. Yeah. So he gets... <laughs> almost, as hard, almost as hard as make cooking meth. Yeah. <laughs> He goes to Scotland to source the mica to an abandoned mine that he basically winds up climbing half the way up a mountain and chipping away for the mica. To get plastic, and his metallurgy <laughs> professor says, plastic is really hard, yo. Um, it comes from petroleum. So he calls BP and says, I'd like to like jump on one of your helicopters and go to um, a... Uh, a well so I could get a jug full of crude oil. And BP said, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> we got a lot of stuff he, laying around. Just, you know, just yeah. go to the shore. We've got crude one oil. leaking out there. Just go and, grab some of that. Exactly. So then he also has to get copper and he gets nickel. And the whole story is more, it's more about the journey than the destination. Um, he winds up making a toaster that heats up to the point where he's afraid it's going to burst into flames, but it does heat up. The toaster itself winds up looking like um, somebody had vomited up a pail full of plastic on top of a, uh, a shoebox. But it does work briefly, so he kind of declares success. All right. I, I love this book. So oh, that's cool. my recommendation. I'm gonna have to check that out. That wow. That that man, he he was a real glutton for punishment. Wow. And I would never process. attempt to make a, a toaster. Yeah. Uh, my struggles with getting our ice maker working in a whole new context. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't actually have to go out and make the tubing. The tube. Yeah. yeah there's in the you know the whole YouTube the YouTube help videos uh, probably weren't really. <coughs> Pre pre uh, uh, industrial age uh, toaster yeah. manufacturer. Cool. Wow. Wow, that's super. That's really cool. And even better, not about knitting. So <laughs> <laughs> all about that. How cool is that? Um, yeah. All righty. Well, I'll uh, I'll wrap it up. Um, and my recommendation is one of my favorite um, websites uh, that basically once a day. Uh, in my Twitter feed, they'll they'll kick out a link to one of their articles, and I'll go over there, and then I'll lose a decent period of time as I poke around looking at all the other ones. And it's called io9, so it's uh, www.io9.com. Um, it was launched in 2008. Uh, it's really part of the Gawker Media conglomerate, if you will, um, and uh, it is a it's a blog that covers science fiction, fantasy, futurism. Uh, technology. So it's just some fascinating, uh, fascinating stuff. They did briefly also have, um, if you go to YouTube and search on io9, we are the future, uh, they did a brief web series as well. So you can kind of get a few few things from there. Uh, so I've enjoyed it for a super long time, but I, you know, uh, prior to, to recommending it on the show, I said, you know, Maybe I need to figure out what IO9 means because <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> I just want to make sure that you know you never know. Uh, but it turns out it was totally made up 
by the folks that started running the blog. But uh, the concept was is that IO9s were marketed as cheap time machines in the 2070s, is the futuristic story, that these are supposed to be time machines. But actually, they were just low-grade input-output devices. Uh, so as people who are kind of, if you think about kind of the body modification stuff, this was more of a, a brain and intellect modification. So IO9s were these things that you would attach to your brain that would give you viv vivid images of possible futures. Uh, they were so addictive that the, the addictive that they drove people insane uh, and eventually outlawed. And so today, and so I'm assuming today is in the 3000s, I don't know, <laughs> the word's just slang. IO9ers are people who do implants. And if you go completely batty, you're referred to as having gone IO9. So that's the, the background of where IO9 came from. Uh, but in terms of uh, actual content, like I said, it daily, there's always something that I love reading and I usually retweet it uh, the, uh, for like they'll take uh, one of the most recent postings was uh, visualizations of Kepler's discoveries. So they'll take kind of just some different science and say here's, different, here's some beautiful visualizations of all the different discoveries by, by Kepler. Um, they'll, uh, they'll do some things around um, uh, current shows and those types of things. So they'll tap into a lot of the current, a lot, particularly a lot of the sci-fi shows that are on currently. So you can kind of check some of those out. And I wanted to also bring up some of the other categories that they they kind of affiliate with a couple other blogs about animals, um, uh, just science fiction in general, and tech. And so it's a great kind of portal to get to a bunch of things. Um, I was going to you know, recommend and kind of give a, a, a tip on the uh, on the animal one of these because Mel's, Mel's a big animal fan and all those types of things. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, the current lead is... Uh, well, the lead article is why are these bears having oral sex? <laughs> is the, the current, so I, I just wanted to pit, I just want to clarify for purposes that, that while this is if you go and you see this article towards the top of the animal part of IO9 or affiliation, that's that's not the usual gig. <laughs> <laughs> that was just unfortunate timing on that, but uh, but it's it really gets into string theory, dark matter, current sci-fi shows. Uh, steampunk, all these types of, types of things. They, they, they're good articles. They're uh, pretty pretty insightful. They don't seem to have a big agenda one way or another beyond just here's some really cool stuff and to share it. Um, I've, like I said, it's eminently retreatable in terms of you'll, you'll see the, the they'll, they'll post pretty regularly, hey, check this article out here. Uh, Game, Game of Thrones stuff is in there. Um, so it's just, it's this kind of mishmash of tech, science, fantasy, and uh, it's just a, it's a great one. And if you you know, should check the site out, uh, but then I highly also recommending uh, following their Twitter account, which I believe is just io at io9. Uh, if that's incorrect, Mel, we can finally use our Matt correction voice drop, <laughs> and we can put in the correct Twitter handle. But I think I'm good on that. Fairly yeah, it's funny since we, since we got that, we haven't been screwing up as much. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it'll happen <laughs> without a doubt, um, but uh, I'd highly recommend just just check it out if it looks like yeah this is kind of content that I I kind of like to stay on top of follow that Twitter account because that'll be uh, that's typically how I um, discover it's time for me to go over mm -hmm. Dio Nine is either either I see their actual tweet or somebody that I'm following has retweeted uh, something that we mutually find interesting and I go to it so. I would recommend, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, make that a destination on that internet for you, io9.com. Yeah, I love that website. It's great. It is fun stuff. I will definitely yep. check that one out. Yeah, it goes from the serious, from serious science stuff to the whimsical. It's got everything for everybody. It's awesome. So uh, I think that wraps us up on recommendations. So it's time to go to social media. Okay. My social media recommendation this week is uh, at Amy Geek. Um, it's Amy Ratcliffe, and her Twitter handle is at Amy underscore Geek. And she's an all-purpose geek blogger. Um, she now is writing for StarWars.com and has a new web series up called Con Woman. But uh, which is about going to cons, not oh, not con. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But but that that could work too. She also is a big fan of Disney. Thought that uh, 
Kelly would appreciate that. But uh, she's an all-purpose geek girl who uh, tweets all sorts of cool stuff and links to all sorts of nerdery and cute geek stuff that's everywhere. And more people need to follow her, though she is not hurting for followers. But check out Amy Ratcliffe at Amy underscore geek on Twitter and learn some more geeky stuff. Cool. We'll go to the McGevna's next for their social media recommendations. Okay. My uh, recommendation this week is uh, at Euronon News, Y-O-U-R-A-N-O-N-N-E-W-S. Uh, basically, the, when you look at their profile, they uh, say they uh, support digital and uh, activism and uh, hashtag uh, save the internet is one of the, part of their profile. Now, Euronon News is the same people that uh, are involved in uh, Occupy Wall Street. Uh, the same kind of people who wear the uh, Guy Fawkes masks. We see them on uh, the Internet uh, mm -hmm. with Anonymous. You know, they're everywhere. They're also associated with uh, things like WikiLeaks. And what they do is they bring in sources, monitor. They, they obviously monitor the uh, various social media around the world. Uh, for developing news, anything uh, of interest that's coming across the, uh, the wires towards them. And uh, they're kind of, as Helena used to say, they're like the canary in the mine. They give you an early warning if something's developing. Like I was looking at it today, and it was showing uh, a picture that someone had tweeted out of uh, some uh, police in the Tibet, I guess in Lhasa, the capital, uh, dressed up with uh, the helmets and the flak jackets and a bunch of older people uh, out in front of them. Uh, I guess there must be another demonstration going on or something mm -hmm. periodically going on in Tibet. And they'll do this for places all over the world. Now, you have to take this, uh, you know, being aware that the sources are not uh, always the, the, the finest. Or not, I shouldn't say the finest, but the source, uh, you have to take it uh, as developing news and take it with a grain of salt. And you, you see something on the Euronon News, you know, and it starts to keep coming in uh, from more sources. That's the time if you're interested in what's developing somewhere in the world to go see uh, regular media. Go to uh, CNN or uh, BBC or Al Jazeera, someplace that might be monitoring some uh, developing event in uh, Cairo or uh, South America or with the Brazil. <laughs> Invariably, they're showing people getting uh, pounded in uh, Rio de Janeiro uh, by the police during the uh, World Cup. Mm -hmm. And it's just a, a very good source of some... Uh, unusual areas or areas that are not normally covered by mainstream news and mainstream media, at least not until it really develops and blows up. And you want an early, uh, early input on what's going on. These are the people for it. Again, uh, these people who post to this may have an agenda. Uh, they may not uh, be the uh, critical reporters that you would normally find on uh, most media, but uh, it's again, I think uh, you, you find it a valuable uh, interest. It's like I say, the canary in the mind. Uh, it just yeah. gives you a heads up. Very yeah, cool. I follow them. I, I agree with you. It's like breaking news from the people before yeah. it hits the mainstream news. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I found them useful as well. I follow them. Cool. Yep. Helena. So my, my, uh, my recommendation is a blog. Uh, you can follow them also on Twitter and Facebook, and it's called scoutingnewyork.com, which is S-C-O-U-T-I-N-G-N-Y.com. And it's written by a guy named Nick Carr, who um, is a New York City <coughs> movie location scout. Um, so he is, um, he, he, he knows the city very well. I'm from New York, and what I love about New York is you wander the streets and you, um, you just stumble across things that are completely puzzling or you stumble across things that you're like, oh my God, so that's where this is. Um, and this is the kind of thing he covers. He did an article about Willett's point that the city no longer even services. He did an article about um, the weirdest beach in New York, which is called Dead Ho on Dead Horse Bay. Um, and just these fascinating little vignettes of New York, lots of photography. Um, it's not heavy reading kind of a blog. It's just lots of photography. Um, and he just kind of finds out, you know, rumor has it there used to be a river running under this apartment building. And he researches it and finds out what's the real, what's the real deal. 
So for people who are native New Yorkers or for people who just really love the city, it's a wonderful site. That's so scoutingnewyork.com. Lots of pictures, few words, you're in my wheelhouse. <laughs> Uh, some really quirky places that uh, he comes across, like uh, <clears throat> the movie uh, Gangs of New York, mm -hmm. uh, located in Five Points. There actually is a place called Five Points in Lower Manhattan, uh, wow. and, it's, and it is laid out in that exact pattern. Obviously, the buildings have changed in the past hundred years, but uh, Helena knows that area, yep. and uh, wow. fascinating uh, stuff Very he comes cool. across. Excellent. Cool. It had been a very long time. Uh, in my life before I actually made it to New York. And, and when all of a sudden it ended up, I was having to go, I was like, oh, this is going to be bad. They're going to spot me as soon as I sit down. <laughs> <laughs> this is Midwest idiot. It's all over for me. And it's going to be all going to be mean to me and whatever. And that was not, that was by far not my experience. It is. I mean, as with any, any, uh, city of size and, and whatever. You, it's always good to kind of keep your wits about you, but what a fascinating place. Very, very cool. So mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed it, and they didn't point at me the second I came off the plane. <laughs> <laughs> they would point at me as soon as I opened up my mouth. <laughs> so. Oh, so... Uh, All right. I'll wrap at? it up on the recommendations, and it's because uh, I, I, in my significant research for the, the show today, as I always put in, uh, I noticed that the name of this show is Nurture and Support. So I thought, maybe maybe I'll make a recommendation that's nurturing and supporting. So I'm actually recommending someone new to Twitter. Uh, and so over the past uh, week or so, I uh, had the opportunity to be uh, sequestered with uh, about 20 of my peers uh, on some, some work we needed to do, uh, some long days, and uh, we got a little punchy as we were getting through all this stuff. And some, shockingly enough, I was being kind of a smart ass during different parts of these, these times we were all together and, and uh, <laughs> playing against type. And somewhere along the lines, I kind of threw out this thing to say, you know, that the, 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 the Litmus test for being savvy in social media was if you had a Twitter account. If you had a Twitter account, oh, you must be an expert in social media. That was pretty much, I did something along those lines uh, in a, probably a sarcastic way at some point in time. And so uh, this gentleman who was sitting beside me, he's like, well, well, I want to be savvy, so, so I need to get Twitter accounts. We're like, okay, next break, we're getting you on Twitter. So we, uh, we signed him up and got him on Twitter. So his, his, uh, well, his Twitter handle is at Holland underscore 72, Holland like the country, Holland underscore uh, uh, 72. And he's new to Twitter, and I tweeted out uh, once he got on, uh, and several folks, like Mel, were very nurturing and supporting and welcomed this individual to, to Twitter. And then several folks were, were not so nurturing and supporting, and poor guy was, was on a break. In five minutes, we get him on Twitter, and I throw his name out, and then some of the people in my connection decide to begin to take this poor guy to task. But <laughs> why haven't you tweeted yet? Why do you have an egg as an icon? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> like, give him a few minutes here. Poor like guy. <laughs> so, so I wanted to kind of uh, make sure that I uh, just got his name out again just to build up some followers. I gave him, and this is probably, you know, not necessarily a good thing, but I gave him Kelly Tools worldview on good Twitter behavior, which you know may or may not oh, no. be, be ideal. Yeah, he's in trouble but, now. Yeah, and, but it was just the idea: hey, someone follows you, go look at their account, and if they don't scare you, follow them back. And uh, if a little bit later you find that you were wrong and they can scare you now, then you can unfollow them, and it's no big deal right. from there. And uh, so he was just, you know, getting the base. You know, if you've been, you know, we're all active on Twitter, and so things that are now kind of second nature to us around, so when I retweet, when should I retweet, when should I should, what are these favorite things, um, uh, when someone follows me, how do I follow back, who should I follow, just he was just kind of starting that process, so so he's he's new to the game, he's interested in learning more, I've told him Twitter is awesome because of the people you can connect to, so I think a lot of the people that listen to Nurture Support are awesome, so if you can connect to him and interact, I'd appreciate that, uh, and just give him, give him a shout, shout out, uh, and we'll see how it goes for him. So that's my recommendation. Okay, we'll definitely yeah, do we've that. Yeah, um, we've all been on Twitter so long, we probably don't remember how scary it was back at the beginning. But, yeah, I'm, I remember I had a couple of fits and starts with Twitter way back when of not understanding and going, what what is the appeal here? 
until you start following the right people, Twitter doesn't make a lot of sense. So, uh, yeah, everybody go go follow Holland underscore 72 and show him the good side of Twitter, not the ugly, dark side we try to keep hidden. <laughs> Really <laughs> judgy. You've been on five minutes. Where's your profile picture side of Twitter? Yeah, yeah. We'll wait for a few weeks to do that to him. Yeah, yeah I think <laughs> that's fair. If you see him out there for a long time and he's still an egg, and he's like, hey, I mean, call an egg. What does that mean? <laughs> <It's> like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry um, about it. You should you know, get home tonight and take your Facebook profile picture and put it in there. You're good. You're fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so cool. Excellent. All right. Cool. Well. Uh, I think that wraps up this episode. Did we have any extras to throw in, Kelly? I didn't ask beforehand. Did you have any? I do not have any extras for this week. I could. Okay. Uh, nope, I don't. Nope, I don't either. So. Well, um, I could uh, just throw in one, th sure. one couple of things, just since it's the uh, particular nurture and support, and it's the given the Sunday it is. Uh, happy Father's Day to Kelly. Uh, <laughs> and uh, recommendations. Uh, my two nominations for Father of the Year. Our Lord Tywin Lannister <laughs> and Darth Vader. I mean, they are exemplars of what it is to be a real father <laughs> to your family. They're definitely very prominent fathers. Especially Lord Lannister, throwing his son to the wolves, literally. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there, there, there are there are uh, marketing now. Um, well, because Disney now owns Star Wars, so every part of Star Wars will be marketed from here on out. But uh, saw some uh, Darth Vader Father's Day based shirts, which looked really sweet. So I would concur with both yeah. of those recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, yes, a lot of good fictional fathers. Speaking of which, um, Kelly, I retweeted earlier. When this airs, it'll be past Father's Day, but. For uh, for anybody out there who may miss it, there is a RJ Mitty um, Father's Day episode out on YouTube. I retweeted it earlier. Oh, really? Um, I'm gonna where he see talks that. about his fictional his fictional father, Walter. Oh, cool. Yeah. I'll have to so, check that um, out. I yeah, will. I'll include a link there, folks, on the blog post, so y'all don't have to go dig for it, just in case you miss it by the time this airs. Yeah, we saw. I saw that. It's excellent. It it was it was, it was fun. quite funny. It was quite funny, and it was done after the series ended. So I, I think it's I think it's brand new. So anyway, y'all will enjoy that. Any of our Breaking Bad fans out there will enjoy watching him talk about Walter and what an awesome father he was. <laughs> Breakfast like is very important. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to learn more about Saul Goodman's father, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mr. Mr. McGill. Yeah, who knows? Who knows about that story? Maybe we will. Maybe we'll find out more. Maybe in Better Call Saul. Who knows? Yeah. Absolutely. So we'd like to thank uh, John Helen and Helena for being on tonight. Absolutely. Was, awesome. Uh, very you. fun. Thank we you like for having us. Yeah. We're, we're we'll, we'll, if you're open, doing. we'll bring you back again because the key thing is guests equal less work for Mel and Kelly. <laughs> 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 We'd be more than happy to uh, accommodate it and uh, get back on with you and we'll look forward to it. Awesome. And we'll have links to uh, their Twitter handles on the blog post, everybody. So I think if we don't have anything else to add, it's time for Matt to take us away. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. You can contact us on our website, nurtureandsupport.net, or email us at nurtandsup at gmail.com. That's N-U-R-T-A-N-D-S-U-P-P -P at gmail.com. Or tweet us at Nert and Sup on Twitter. Nurturing and supporting Terminator.